All right, and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Because this is a webinar, you might not notice, you might notice there isn't a camera option to speak or have your video shared, but we do still want to hear from you. So please feel free to use the chat for introductions, let us know where you're dialing in from, etc. We'll have a designated Q&A at the end. You can submit questions for our panelists anytime throughout the discussion using Zoom's Q&A feature, and you can upvote questions. My name is Adrian O'Donnell. I'm the Educations Program Manager at the Printing Museum here in Houston. And Kelly, am I sharing my screen or am I sharing my notes there? Screen, looks good. So you're able to see the splash screen, great. Yes. Thank you. The Printing Museum is proud to partner with AIGA, the Professional Association for Design, and the League of Women Voters to present Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote, Poster Exhibition, a collection of posters by women of design commemorating the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and motivating present day voter engagement. With our partners and other co-exhibiting institutions, we also strive to encourage broader civic participation. Diverse voices using design to enlighten, inform, and inspire is central to our mission at the Printing Museum. Support for this exhibition is funded in part by AIGA and the City of Houston through Houston Arts Alliance. The exhibit is on display at the Printing Museum now through November 21st, 2020. To coincide with the exhibit's opening, we're pleased to be hosting this panel discussion of the exhibit, AIGA, Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote. I would like to introduce you to the organizers of this important exhibition. Kelly, Kelly Salco MacArthur is a professor of graphic design at Michigan State University. She is president of the international design organization, United Designs Alliance, and is president emerita of AIGA Detroit. Nancy Skolas teaches at Rhode Island School of Design. She is an AIGA fellow, recipient of the 2017 AIGA medal, and elected member of AGI, the Alliance Graphique Internationale. Together, Kelly and Nancy have invited a core group of 70 women of design to participate in a special poster collection for the exhibition of Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote. Today, they join us along with several of the artists participating in the show. We have Kelly Chang, Professor of Visual Communication Design at the University of Washington. Renee Seward, Associate Professor, Communication Design Coordinator at the University of Cincinnati. And Shanti Sparrow, Australian illustrator, designer, educator, living and creating in New York City. And without further ado, I would like to hand it off to Kelly to tell you more about this project. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. First slide. Okay. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you to the Printing Museum of Houston and for everybody joining us today on the panel as well as attending to listen. I'm gonna start by sharing just a few images and some information about how this project got started. Um, the idea came to me in 2018 when I started reading articles and seeing uh, information that 2020 would be the 100th year of women's right to vote in the United States. It occurred to me that this would be a historic opportunity to unify women in design and uh, work together to uh, share one goal, a civic goal of empowering the women's vote. I also knew at that moment, as I started to dream about this potential project, that Nancy Skolos, one of my all-time design heroes in the field of graphic design, would be a perfect woman to partner with on this project. I had been um, lucky enough to be one of her students when I was in grad school at RISD, and she was someone that, that I was totally in awe of before I worked with her. It's been great to work with her on this project, and it's become what it could be because of her involvement. So as I go through these images, Nancy, feel free to jump in at any moment. <laughs> oh, thanks, um, <laughs> as Adrian mentioned, we started with a, a list of women that we invited to participate, and we were so grateful that many of them accepted our invitation. Um, those that did also were given the opportunity to invite another 
uh, woman of design um, in a way to, um, to propagate um, inclusion and mentorship in our community. Let's see. Now, for some reason, I'm not able to forward. So let's see if I can do it manually here. Okay. Um, we've all probably seen images like this of uh, suffragist parades. This one is from 1915 in New York City as women were marching to try to get um, women's voting rights uh, onto the New York uh, state constitution. We can see here that suffragists used visual communication in their movement by wearing white. They recognized that this would stand out in a crowd of dark suits. It was also cheaper than colored fabric. They had an entire color palette that they worked with. The palette of purple, yellow, and white stood for loyalty, purity, and hope. And they were determined to combat their critics' rumors that they were devilish Amazons set to destroy gender, gender hierarchies. <laughs> Uh, they promised to bring skill and civility to politics and corruption. It had been 42 years since the women's suffrage amendment was first brought to Congress. And on August 18th, uh, Congress decided uh, it, that it came down to one vote uh, of 24 year old Congressman Harry Burns. After a plea from his mother, he actually changed his vote to support suffrage. Uh, the 19th Amendment gave the right of citizens of the United States uh, that they could vote. Uh, the, oh my gosh, I'm really stumbling here, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the vote should not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Of course, by that time, many other countries had already granted women the right to vote, including Australia, Finland, Germany, Canada, Russia, New Zealand, the Netherlands. Um, as Nancy and I started talking about and brainstorming this, this project, this initiative, we recognize that graphic design has consistently been used as a powerful tool in politics. And poster design was oftentimes the format that these messages were shared. So for over 100 years, that's been the case. Uh, a couple cases in point here are a couple of well-known posters that now reside firmly in design history. Through doing research, we've found out that women make up over half of the population in the United States. In 2016, just over 63% of women voted in the presidential election. And actually more women have voted in every presidential election since 1964. And we are wondering what that percentage will be in 2020. As we started working on this project, um, Initially, it was the, the subhead was celebrating 100 years of the women's vote. But in responding to colleagues' comments, reflecting, doing more research, we definitely realized that this has not been a smooth or equal path towards voting rights. And um, our, our subtitle that we've adopted, Empowering the Women's Vote, I think more aptly, um, captures what we've learned in our research, as well as where we intend to go with this project. Now, this is just a zoomed in version of the timeline that I pulled together, which is a, a really long and complex path of women's fight for equality and voting rights. And something that I think is telling in this uh, timeline is, and I don't know if you can see this on screen very clearly, but there are instances that are, uh, um, purple instead of black. And those are the first women to achieve that role or that political position. That becomes much more dense as we get to modern day. That's exciting. We've been making some uh, great strides and I'm really excited to see where we go next. And at this point, I'll hand it off to Nancy to talk about her poster. Yeah, we, we thought it would be fun to just say a few words about the design process. Uh, as you can see in the in the picture in the upper left, I, my initial thought was to kind of contrast something discarded with something amplified. I was even thinking of women's Kleenex with their lipstick on it, sort of like the objectified version of women, and then the more like um, assertive megaphone kind of uh, 
uh, image. So I did a lot of work trying to make it really uh, come together. And this was in the middle is what I came up with in the end. And I could say just a few um, things about my poster. I too started with the photographic process. Um, I had realized that the thing that I kept going back to and conceptualizing what I could do with the poster is the equal sign. And in playing with the equal sign, I really liked that in rotating and juxtaposing it, it could start to look like an interwoven uh, piece. I hope that this clarifies that when we work together, we are stronger. And that day that we vote, it doesn't matter what our background is or what gender we are, but we are equal when we cast a ballot. Um, the two images on the left were just evidence of me grappling with what message would work with the, the visuals that I was um, working with. I kept going back to the her voice equals her vote. I really liked that message, but you can see in the larger version, the poster that I uh, landed on. Uh, we could not have predicted what 2020 would bring. Our country faces many challenges right now. We do hope that the efforts that we've put into this project contribute to forward motion of our society. The initiative continues at AIJ.org forward slash vote. Um, anyone who is an AIJ member can um, design and upload a poster to the site. And what is really outstanding about this initiative is that all the posters that are in the exhibition and that are uploaded by additional designers are free and available to the public. So I hope that these posters really get out there and um, find their way into storefronts and yards and t-shirts and anything else that anyone could come up with as a way to use those. Adrian mentioned that we had 71 women contribute 65 posters. It was an outstanding list. Um, really great to work with these women. They came up with some amazing posters. And we'll be hearing from Karen, Renee, and Shanti today. Thank you. I'll hand it off to Karen now. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, so let me see if I can actually share screens. It's a little bit tricky. Um, so my own approach, I tend to start with the typography. Some people would say I'm obsessed with um, letter forms. I've actually written a whole book about uh, the design of type called Designing Type. And so one of the interesting things about the field of type design is that actually, you know, it's not, it's dominated largely by men. About 30% of type designers are, are women. And so when I got your um, call for this poster, um, I was really excited about trying to use a typeface designed by a woman because I thought it would be really weird to make a protest poster about <laughs> a women's vote using a man's typeface. I just thought that didn't make any sense. And actually, I had just been enjoying this wonderful Kickstarter book called Femme Type that was part of actually a student graduate thesis. And so for those of you in the audience who would like to get your own copy, it's still available it was published by Slanted. Um, and it's not too bad. I guess it's 32 euros. Um, and if that's a little too much, they also publish what's called a poster zine, which is kind of, um, you know, a poster that's a folder mailer that has a little bit more information about female type designers. You can see it here. And so you can see the poster zine website. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, so the typefaces I was most interested in after, you know, going through that book was there's this fun typeface by Joanne Olson, and I guess she made this as a parting gift for her employer at a studio, and she describes him as a very tall, thin man, and I guess that's why the typeface is also very tall and thin. Actually, after looking at this typeface, I was like, I have to meet this guy, you know, <laughs> so. So it's sort of fun. Uh, but I actually wound up using a typeface by Inga Plonix um, that's called Magnet. And actually, um, the typeface is not available yet for re release. It's going to be released by the Heffler, oh, sorry, 
the Tobias Ferrer Jones uh, foundry. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because it has both a, black, a back slant as well as a forward slant. And I thought that was really interesting in terms of the left right dynamic, you know, that animates politics now. And it's just gorgeous. Um, so if you want to make a typographic poster, obviously you've got to have some type to set. And so I was trying to think of what would be appropriate. And so there's some great women's speeches at suffrage meetings, this one in Omaha. So for a while I tried um, for a long time with some of these quotes, like I like this, up with the petticoats and down with the pants. <laughs> Especially the parentheses, like howls, howls of applause. You know, I thought that was amazing. Um, but I was also interested in this different idea about women's issues. I was thinking like, okay, well, they often say women vote because there are certain women's issues. So I made this list of these different women's issues. Um, you know, and then I actually worked with Magnet on this for some time. But then I started to feel like, are these women's issues? Like, you know, because some of them seem like they're everybody's issues like you know violence pollution social security you know I don't know that I thought they were women's issues and then I didn't know that I thought those posters were successful just because they were so busy I thought that well you know if you looked at that from a distance maybe you wouldn't see anything um, so I thought back to when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s you know Ms had kind of entered its second dead decade and there was a lot of tension still about like people would be like hey are you not going to use miss or misses you're going to use ms this new term you know and so people it was still controversial at that time that there was a new honorific so i started thinking about these names for women and uh, i just started to write down when i would come across like a new name for a woman on twitter or on facebook or you know in the new york times uh you know and it is interesting to think about all the roles women play um, in society, that we're mothers, you know, we're wives, we're lovers, you're supposed to be sexy, you can be the boss, you know, <laughs> all these kinds of things, and, and how difficult that is, and how that, you know, is still all in the background for us, I think, as women. So this is the poster, you know, that essentially I tried to take like the names of women that would be the most universal and kind of touch on those different roles that we play but also end it by saying you know we're all voters we're all humans we're all citizens we're all participants and we're all americans and that like you know that's what matters i think in terms of the women's vote okay so that's my little bit so i'll stop sharing thank you karen All right, I think I'll go next. Um, so let me just give me a second here so I can share screen. All right, I created a little video and I'm just going to allow this to play while I talk through it. So a little bit of my process started with research and while I like kind of knew what the research was, I began looking at it again from the role of what role did black women and black individuals as a whole play in the suffrage movement. And after doing the research again, I became very outraged. And I actually created this poster before George Floyd, um, the tragic events of, around George Floyd. It was right after Ahmaud Aubrey, um, who was running. And I am a runner. I've been followed before as a runner. And so there was a lot building up from the research and just the things that were going on. Let alone, my family has a big role to play in the right to vote in the civil rights movement. My great grandmother wrote the We Shall Overcome song for the civil rights movement. And she used her talents in songwriting and singing to play a role in it. And now I'm like, here's my opportunity to say something through what I do as a designer. And so it all built up and it spilled out into a fun make activity. Every aggression and thing that I was feeling, I just started creating things in one day. And at the end of that day, I was like, woof. Now let's just go eat something, you know, and I left it at the studies. And the next day I scanned them in and I started to try and make sense of them and make sense of the messaging. And there was actually a couple of different visual studies that came out of them and had to step back and say, you know, what am I saying and how am I saying it? 
the typefaces that I ultimately chose, um, a condensed face. This was not an easy time. It was full of frustration. We didn't, couldn't be polite in getting to where we got to. So using the condensed face is what I thought of, but also using a bold weight of that face because you had to be unapologetically fierce in what you were saying. Um, so the final poster that I created, I have to think about, I am a woman and then I am Black. And as you look at uh, this, Black women played a huge role in the suffrage movement. And at the end of it, we're not afforded that role. So their identity of being Black was ultimately the thing that defined them. So in this poster, the Black had to move through and push past the woman's vote in order for us to achieve it, because it took another whole 45 years before we were afforded that right. And so this poster is really targeted to Black women. Um, letting us know that back then you had to would have had to wait another 45 years before you can affect or have your say and change. And now we don't have to wait another 45. It's time to gather at the polls and it's time to vote because all the fears that we hold and fears for our husbands and children's and nephews and things um, in response to everything that's happening in the world right now. We need to go to the polls and let our voices be heard. So this is more of an encouragement to let us know that we have that power and we have the power to move forward. So um, I tried to use Ida B. Wells. She played a significant role in the civil rights movement. So I lift as I climb, that's in there. And then I had to put my great grandmother's song, We Shall Overcome in there as well. So there you go. Hi, that was amazing, Renee. Oh my gosh, Thank I you. love that. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. Everybody seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I might, well, firstly, I'd love to thank uh, Kelly, Nancy, AIGA, the Print Museum, uh, for inviting me here to talk. Uh, and also Karen and Renee, who, you know, incredible creatives that we're seeing. So I'm Shanti Sparrow, and maybe you can tell I'm an Australian graphic designer and illustrator and educator. And I've been a resident in the US for uh, the last three and a half, almost four years. So when asked to participate in this project, I was really excited because issues of gender equality have been a key focus in my creative expression for quite a long time. Um, but, you know, being a relatively new resident in America, I really wanted to make sure that I had, you know, proper context and an understanding of the journey of the women's vote through an American lens. So with most of my creative expression, it always starts with the research. So um, Kelly's already touched on, on these things here, but, you know, looking back, looking at the 19th Amendment, um, which on paper stands for gender equality, but in practicality, was definitely uh, not so much. It excluded Indigenous, Black, Asian and other women of colour. Um, in this era, suffragist messages of equality were often um, inherently racially suppressive. So it wasn't until, you know, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, maybe the Extended Voting Rights Act of 1975, that you can start to consider all women got the, the right and access to vote. Um, and I would add that arguably repression is still a problem that we face today in, in some ways. So for these reasons, I chose not to center my poster and the content on celebrating the centenary um, because it just didn't feel like the intersectional marker of women's rights that I wanted to, to focus on. So this led me looking at today and almost to my surprise, I learned about the emergence of the gender voting gap so perhaps due to the long road that women have had to gain the vote, we now see a trend since 1984 in the US of women turning out to vote at a slightly higher rate than men. So we saw some stats just before. So 63% of women who were eligible to vote said they cast a ballot in the 2016 presidential election compared with 59% of men. And in addition to the voter turnout, the gender voting gap is also seen in the way that men and women are voting. They're, they're voting increasingly differently. Uh, so women on the whole are voting more democratic than men. And for better or worse, we're seeing women electing with increasingly different values and perspectives than men. So um, in terms of poster messaging, this is what I, I really wanted to get into. It was so interesting. So it, it's gone from a position of suppression in terms of women 
to us now being a majority. So it's gone to an empowerment state. In numbers, women now have the power to decide elections. And, uh, you know, in its purest form, women decide. And I really liked that that was such just a powerful statement. And it led to this design here. Um, so, you know, the design of the poster reflects the change in that power balance, the turning of a new page in history that put women in the position of being the decision maker. Uh, you know, it also has visual connotations of physical stacks of votes, um, maybe mail-in votes this year. So, you know, voting is one of the most powerful things you can do. And I feel this more than ever being a resident in the US who is ineligible to vote. So the greatest power I have in this current environment is to encourage others to go and vote and my power to affect changes in design and it's in this poster. Um, and I'm so thankful for this project being around and that I have a skill set in design and this platform that, you know, I can hopefully help affect a little bit of change. And thank you for your time. Well, thank you, ladies. Thank you all for sharing. It's been wonderful hearing the designs and the inspiration behind your designs and how they come together. I'm going to share my screen while if anyone has any questions for the panelists, please pop them into the Q&A and we will get them answered for you. And while we're kind of thinking of those, let me share my screen again and show you guys some of the installations that we have for this exhibit at the Printing Museum, since I know not everybody is dialing in from Houston today. So the Printing Museum uh, is in Houston, Texas. This is the exterior of our building. We've got a great little printing press out front. You can identify us and find us. We have installed this exhibit in our front lobby, in the hallways, and in our galleries. It's a fantastic exhibit where we've been able to print out all of the posters that are in the catalog. If you stop by the printing museum, you're able to pick up a free copy of the catalog. So please do come visit us. This is the front lobby, the entryway, where we have the uh, get out the vote signage at the beginning there. And down the hallways, and there you can see Nancy's poster. And then going down the hallway again, where we've got posters on both sides, and this is leading up to the gallery where we also have all of the posters installed. There's 60 plus posters um, that we've printed out. And there you can see Renee's poster and Shanti's as well. And there we go. And the posters, as a reminder, are available to download as well, like Kelly said. So I'm just going to leave this slide up here for now um, as we get into the Q&A portion. So we had answered already. Great question was, will the timeline be available to view after the webinar? And so, yes, so we've, we've got that available and we've posted a link for that as well. And another one was the webinar, will that be available for viewing later? Uh, we are recording this one so that yes, we can share the recording of this webinar as well. I've been elected to be the Q&A moderator and I see we do have a question in our little Q&A box. Um, someone's asking about the history of um, of women's vote posters over the decades and how the visual design has changed over the years and how the messages have changed. Um, I don't really know specifically about so much about women's voting posters. I, I do have a little of knowledge about protest art. Um, do you all wanna take a, take a spin at this question? Go for it, Nancy. Well, um, one thing, one thing that really is, was interesting that we didn't realize when we picked these three panelists is all of your designs were typographic, you know, like um, using the type as the voice. And I think that is pretty common in pro protest art because a lot of it's placards and signs. And I, I was doing a little bit of research um, 
on uh, the, the famous I am a man poster that was from um, a Memphis strike, like right around, um, you know, in the, in the 60s. And um, it kind of reminded me of Karen's poster because it's a white background with red letters and the words M and man are kind of condensed and they rhyme with each other. And it kind of like, even though it says I am a man, it, it has that, you know, that's that essence of I am somebody, which I think these women were also in that, that same kind of arena where they felt like they weren't, they didn't exist or they didn't have any kind of like value or voice. So, um, and I was reading that those posters, no one really knows who designed them. They think <clears throat> maybe it was like somebody at the printing company, but if you can find one now, they go for auction at like $34,000. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of an interesting history. Um, let's see, that's like the most famous one I can think of. Do you guys have other ones? I think it's been interesting to just to do research and look back at all these old photographs of marches and the the strong messages that these women were printing on these handmade and hand painted you know signs um, really empowering and and really pushing there was nothing shy about what they were doing back then I was going to say that, like, I looked through a lot of old things because I was trying to figure out, like, what would be an interesting message and so forth. And um, most of the posters I saw the women carrying just said votes for women. You know, it was really that simple. Um, what's more weird is all the different... Um, like propaganda pamphlets. Like I'd, I have one that I could share um, later, I guess, but it like, um, they combined it with a household hints for women. <laughs> like there was a little brochure that was like household hints for women. And it was like how to clean things and you know, how to like, you know, save time and stuff like that. Then there was an extra page that said uh, why women shouldn't get the vote. And like one of the, you know, key arguments were um, it would cost twice as much for women to vote because, and that was just a waste because women would vote the same as men anyway. So why should we pay, you know, extra to, you know, allow, you know, twice as many people to vote with no outcome, you know? <laughs> so, and then some of the arguments as Renee kind of referred to were pretty disturbing because in the South, I mean, a lot of people didn't want the vote because then they said you'd have to give the vote to black women and that would just be devastating. Like they said right there in black and white that that would harm white supremacy, you know? So I really thought that was horrible. Um. Here's a good question um, from Annabelle Gould, uh, saying the posters are all fantastic. It's great to see just varied solutions. What were the dominant themes addressed across the 60 plus posters? Were there any unexpected angles that some designers came from? And uh, this would be interesting because Kelly, you probably spent the most time when you laid out the catalog, but I, I noticed some sort of categories, you know, the typographic posters, the more data-driven posters, um, in terms of themes, did you see anything, um, any threads emerging? Um, you know, I was wondering if when we put this call out that the posters would focus more on um, voter participation than women's issues or the women's vote specifically. And I was happy to see that a lot of the posters seemed to touch on or refer to research and um, really be focused on the women's vote. Um, and maybe kind of touching on another question that I saw in the chat box here, I can fold this into another discussion that AIGA has um, run a get out the vote poster campaign every four years for, I think it's been four or five presidential cycles now. Um, but this was unique because of the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And it just so happens that AIJ is still running their uh, general get out the vote campaign parallel to this get out the vote campaign, empowering the women's vote. So if anyone goes to the AIJ site, you'll see you know, a graphic and submission options for both of those. I think um, 
this was too good of an opportunity to not take advantage of. Um, but still, AIJ wanted to present the opportunity to um, for anybody to design uh, a poster for just voter participation, not specific to uh, the women's vote. Yeah, and someone's asking um, if the catalog was organized thematically, and Kelly and I debated about that, and we decided to just do alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, as all posters do, some of them sort of clashed with each other. And we thought, well, you know, maybe a chance operation of just the alphabet would be the best bet. The, the only instance where we broke out of the alphabetical order was by putting Francis Ilana's uh, poster on the back cover, which was like two away from, well, one away from being the last one alphabetically. But it was such the perfect closing message because uh, Francis did a hand paint and sign that actually ended up looking very historic to me um, that said a woman's work is never done and as you close the catalog it, it is a nice way to end that yes this is one chapter but we have a lot of progress to make still and you know where will we go next and, and I also I have to say it has been so um, eye-opening and enriching to have worked with the women who did contribute posters and bring their own perspectives and their own personal narratives. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've uncovered and helped give um, attention and visuals to the, the struggles that different groups have faced. I think Renee's presentation hit that on the head very clearly, and I so appreciate that. that is, that's a conversation we need to be having. And it was interesting hearing you talk about the organization, the curation and the order for the catalog. We also, when we were putting up the posters at the printing museum, we asked ourselves the same question. And so we, we went with the same, same order that you had there in the catalog. <laughs> Perfect. Um, do we have, I'm not sure how much time there is left. I can introduce another question. Um, I, I, I really love the aspect of the project that Kelly mentioned where we were, we were excited to work together as a community of women designers sort of, you know, mentoring and connecting with each other. I wondered if you guys have any like important mentors, women mentors and from your background, your education. I mean, it's really wonderful, Renee, that you're grandmother wrote that song that's so amazing. So we have these strong women in our lives that really inspire us. Um, and also maybe, uh, let's see, um, let's see if there are any other questions in here. We had a printing museum question that I'd be happy to answer, which was, when, how can I come visit you? And so that one I can handle. We are open from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, from noon to 4 p.m. And we are you're able to get advanced tickets um, and social distance safely. Um, tickets can be bought online. General admission is $8. For students, it's $5. And we would love to have you come visit. And this exhibit will be up through November 21st, Saturday the 21st, just in time for uh, the election cycle. We're going to keep it up past, past election day. We want everybody to register to vote as well, very important. Um, so we hope throughout this election cycle you'll be, be thinking of that. Um, it looks like there's some questions in the chat as well. Um... They're asking if we researched the voting rights in other countries. Um, so that was interesting. We thought about maybe putting some of that in the catalog. Um, and actually, Nancy, when we first started brainstorming about this way back, you and I were talking about whether we should open it up internationally or not, or if we should keep it to women in design in the United States, and we decided to keep it in the United States just because this was, you know, 
where the presidential election will be happening in 2020, November 3rd. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that the United States is not the leader in the world in poster design, you know, because it's never really been a, a big medium here. It's, it hasn't been a, a great disseminator of uh, information. But I, so it was really fun to kind of stir things up and try to get it going more in the U.S. and work with the women here. I was waiting to see if others would respond, but I wanted to respond to your question about that, you know, women mentors and so forth, you know, like I went to the University of Cincinnati where um, Kelly's father actually taught Gordon and it was all guys like it was Gordon, <laughs> you know, Robert and Heitschaker, Joe Batoni, but they were great guys. I don't think it, you know, I thought that was a great education, whether they were women or not, uh, you know, but I wanted to say a woman who really inspired me as like one of the first clients I had was a woman named Dr. Harmony. She ran the U University of Cincinnati MD-PhD program. And I was referred to her for a freelance project where they were going to um, you know, redo all those materials. And I guess it's kind of unusual that a client would be Come, kind of a mentor or so forth. But she was another woman in academia. I would say she was probably in her late 40s, early 50s when I met her and I was in my mid 20s, you know, and she was so supportive and great and interested in design. And I thought all clients would be like that. <laughs> that you know, this was going to be really easy. You know, like she always wanted to do what I considered to be like the right thing in terms of like production or messages and so forth and I did feel a real sense of like mentoring from her you know and then maybe on a more facetious note like um you know, I watched that TV show, The Good Wife, and then their spinoff as well, you know, The Good Fight. And I am so inspired by all those images of what it looks like to be like a strong, working, thoughtful, yet vulnerable and human, emotional woman on that TV show. And I love to see that representation happening in popular culture. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of roles for women are the girlfriend, the wife, you know, the hostage, <laughs> you know, or some sort of thing. And it's great to see women moving into different roles or, you know, there being more female comedians, like that means a, a lot to me too, especially more Asians on TV, you know, like fresh off the boat, you know. So I think that the country is moving in a positive direction in terms of, you know, more role models, female role models, um, you know, that are beyond sort of the the badass woman or the cold Glenn Close kind of, you know, figure. Yeah, I was really fortunate to study with Kathy McCoy, which was total luck out. And also um, that April Griman was really, um, you know, coming into the limelight when I was graduating from school and she was like a wonderful genius to kind of aspire to. Um, I would I would say in addition to like my grandmother who, um, I was trying to find a picture of her because there's this picture of her standing amongst the great men of the civil rights movement um, that we talk about often and there she is in her dress and she's like, I'm here, I'm helping organize this too. Um, outside of her, you know, I am inspired by um, in graduate school, Meredith Davis was one of my instructors. So I guess graduate school, we kind of come into our own. And at the University of Cincinnati, the males that Karen mentioned, because I I graduated from there as well, they gave me voice, you know, I was like always the only, and they were like, let's talk about it. Let's go ask some people some questions. But only when I got to graduate school, Meredith even pushed that up further, you know, like bring it out to the limelight. Let's, and so I, I appreciate her and everything that she stands for. I agree. I see my colleague Annabelle Gould mentioned Meredith as well and uh, other NCU faculty, you know, and yeah, at Cranbrook again, you know, Laurie Haycock, Michaela. I mean, I think there are some amazing women in design. It's just that um, I guess in my little world, I wasn't touched by it, <laughs> you know, but it was, it's great. I mean, there have been some amazing female design leaders. I mean, many people mentioned Paula Cher as someone they look up to, for example. Yeah, when I was an undergrad at University of Cincinnati, I uh, co opted at Pentagram in New York twice in Michael Beirut's team. And that was a, such a formative experience and 
um, really a perfect complement to my schoolwork at UC. But uh, someone that I really loved watching work was Paula. And she was working on the public theater posters at the time and coming in with one regularly and just seeing how the, that process was, was happening was really exciting. Maybe it goes along with another question in the chat where they talked about like, you know, how do you think your posters, did you think about the posters like being seen by men or do you think about it as a female audience? I did kind of wonder about that, whether it was seen, I know you said, Nancy, when you posted some of the posters on Facebook that people said, why are women so angry? <laughs> you know, like I was curious about how you, you guys felt about that you know, the other posters, like, did you worry about like the male response? I'm hoping that a lot of men will contribute posters on the AIJ site. Nancy, what do you think? You know, I have to admit, I didn't really think that much about the men when we were working on this. Um, but uh, it would be great if they wanted to contribute, yeah. It does seem think that, I oh, sorry, go ahead, Renee. I think that when I was making, I, when I was making it, I was just expressing and trying to create a message. But when it came time to like, now I have to upload it. I'm like, I don't know if this is what they were looking for. I don't know if I'm disrupting the thing that they were actually trying to do. I'm just going to put it up there, close my eyes and keep moving forward. So I was concerned, not just about men. I was concerned about the reception in general. And um, yeah. Well, I did show my poster to my husband, who's also a graphic designer, and he was just like, cool. <laughs> so I guess I felt like, well, at least he's in my corner. <laughs> yeah. I have a question maybe for the other panelists. Um, from what I can tell, what we've just participated in is somewhat historic. Have any of you heard of anything like this occurring in the past with women in graphic design merging together for one, one effort, one goal? I took it out of my um, slide deck because I couldn't make it quite fit in, but there's a wonderful group of women in type design called the alphabets, you know, so it's B-E-T-T-E-S, you know, the alphabets. And you can go on their website. It's, it's less graphic design oriented and more type design oriented, but they do try to basically elevate the voices of female type designers. And I found that to be like a wonderful community, you know, they're just, um, um, it's, it's very like sisters. I mean, I, I was in the femtype book that was brought up just before. And I remember that feeling pretty special and really inclusive. And it, it really helped me, you know, find a community and, and network in, in that way. So that, that was pretty special. I do hope that um, there will be less and less need to categorize designers in the future. You know, the, the fact that there's a, a woman of women of design book says a lot to me. There doesn't have to be a men of design book because that's what all the books are, right? So, and there could be a black women of design book, but there shouldn't be, you know? There, I really want this, uh, where, where we're headed now to be more inclusive and more diverse and, and, uh, support everyone. Um, there's a question about um, process, like asking if designers still uh, hand draw or silk screen posters or if it's all done on computers. And I, th I think if you look closely at the collection we have, there are there is kind of a range of ways people produce these things. Some were like photographic collages and um, some were more, um, more computer uh, assembled, but uh, I feel like there was a really unique process to almost every single one of them. Um, you know, if you look at Susanna Lichko, she was like working with geometry and pattern. Uh, I think it's a really rich uh, range of, of uh, methodologies, like, and, and I think the process for a lot of people does still involve a lot of handwork, um, just depends. I, I'm a real, I think we all love graphic design 
time because we love doing it and we love the whole process. So that's a great question. Do you guys want to chime in on that? Um, like Shanti, I'd be interested in your process because it looked like um, a very computer um, finished piece, but what did you use a certain type of like 3D software or something? Uh, no, I mean, 3D is something I definitely would love to, to learn more about. Um, mine is really, really simple techniques in Illustrator to create that sort of 3D effect. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, seeing all of the handmade posters uh, that were presented today, I'm almost jealous that I didn't, you know, set it up and shoot it. But yeah, it was all digital on my end. Uh, it doesn't look simple to me, so <laughs> it looks simple to you. Uh, um, Kelly, was, you did obviously, yours was a sort of a photographic weave of paper, right? And then you, you did the graphics on top of that? Yeah. Yeah, so I started with photographs <clears throat> of, yeah, the woven piece and tried a bunch of different points of view and shading and as I brought it into the poster format on screen, I was figuring out the crop. And pretty quickly, if I, I realized if I would tilt the perspective, I would lose the legibility of that weave. So I had to keep it flat to the picture plane. And then was working with bringing the type and the color on through Illustrator on top of that. But I definitely try to work with my hands as much as possible. And those were very, those, that was a lot of strips cut very precisely. <laughs> I was wondering, Nancy, just because like, you know, you're part of a famous duo, you know, um, with your husband, did you consider, you know, working with him on it? Or were you like, yay, <laughs> you know, by myself? I thought it would be breaking the rules if I worked with him on it. So <laughs> I, I didn't really let him, you know, help me, except he did sort of click the shutter when we photographed the final thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, it was kind of weird to work by myself. And I've also been putting together um, sort of an archive of our work. And as I've been doing it through the decades, I've realized that, you know, that it's not like a 50-50 on each piece. You know, I wanted to almost put the percentages on each page, like some are like 90% him and 10% me and vice versa. I mean, there's, there aren't that many that are exactly 50-50. So I think that's what's, with a, with a really strong collaboration, you just have to know who has the better idea and just run with it and not worry so much about homogenizing it as a peer collaboration. So it was fun to work by myself, actually. <laughs> so, um, Uh, Karen, I really enjoyed uh, reading your blurb about your process that's on the AIGA website. And, um, you know, just that whole idea of the complexity of ro the roles women have and all the stuff we're supposed to negotiate and, and kind of that with this, ki with this empowerment, there's also a lot of complexity and responsibility. And I thought that really made the poster even more powerful thinking about that. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it seems a little whiny, doesn't it? Like we have all these options now, you know, but it is, I do feel it's a challenge to wear so many hats. I think the interesting thing though is like, as we've, you know, I'm the old person now in our faculty group because Chris Zupko retired. And so I'm 50 now, along with like my other colleagues, um, you know, are entering that. And you see some of the younger faculty who come on, especially men, like they take much more responsibility for parenting and for being you know part of the home you know so I do think that's an encouraging trend and maybe they also experience some of that like mental hat shifting as well you know like so I don't know we don't have the answer maybe to um, how should we parent <laughs> <laughs> you know I still think that's such a dominant part of you know being a working woman today managing that issue so are you a parent? 
No, in fact, I couldn't imagine making the time for that. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't figure out. I know it's really horrible. I said it once to that woman who I mentioned was like a great client of mine. She was like, what are you thinking about having kids? And I said, I can't think about that. I have all these brochures to do. <laughs> she was like, um, you might want to think about these priorities, <laughs> you know? But I do think, I mean, I admire, you know, the women I work with who do have kids and the balance, especially now with coronavirus. I mean, I actually have more time probably to work on design, but I think many people have less. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kelly, I know you have a couple of kids. Shanti, Renee, do you have children? Have you fitted into your... Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. It's interesting that that's a question that gets asked, though, you know. Yeah, there's, I didn't include it on my thing. <laughs> Sorry to me to cut you off, Shanti. I was saying, like, there's a great Twitter account that's called Man Who Has It All, and he just retweets things with the genders reversed. So it would be rare at a panel for us to ask men, like, do you have kids? How do you manage it? <laughs> so... Sorry, I'm really drifting now. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe it was too personal of a question. Like, I, I also don't have children because I couldn't really figure out how to fit it in. Um, so, Kelly, I guess you're the champ here. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. <laughs> it's really, really crazy, you know? I think I'd, I'd be spending more time on the work and if I didn't have the kids and vice versa. I'd be spending a lot more time with them if I didn't have the work. Um, but it's quite a balancing act, that's for sure. I like to say that having kids is my most challenging design project to date. <laughs> Do they bring inspiration from, you know, to the process through what, what kind of things they're doing? Um, maybe not so much them bringing inspiration as much as um, me having them do projects sometimes. So if, you know, they'll be interested in what I'm doing and they'll come hang out behind me and get in my area and mess with my stuff. And so I have to give them the, the project prompt that I'm working on and see what they come up with. So they've designed some animal icons that are pretty good. They've made some monoliths for spatial design. Um, they might be little designers in the making, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. And the woven piece that I put in my poster, they ended up making it into a Father's Day card. Oh. <laughs> I'm curious about that, Kelly. Like, did you try other things besides paper? I was kind of wondering about that, if you would try ribbon. Like, I was kind of thinking if Nancy would do it. I mean, Nancy's kind of famous for, like, you know, physical um, collaging like that, you know? Yeah, I was thinking about the materials. And knowing that whatever material I chose would have an implication in terms of meaning. Yeah. And yeah. So I wanted to be very careful with that. Um, yeah, so I, I thought paper would be, would give me a blank slate, you know, in terms of like them being able to bring the context onto it in Illustrator. But you're right. Yeah, that makes sense. I was wondering whether you were inspired by the sashes that the suffragettes wore, you know, like I thought that was kind of an interesting allusion to it, you know, or even that weaving is kind of a woman's work type thing as well. I did think of, I did think of that, yeah, that this would kind of be a home craft kind of uh, implication. Yeah, or I thought about it could be done with pie. I've tried to make pie several <laughs> times where you weave the crust, but they're never successful. <laughs> so, but I thought it would be interesting to use something physical. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I'm just cognizant of time and I appreciate that you've joined us here for your lunch hour today. Um, if you're in Houston, come visit us at the Printing Museum. We're open Thursday through Saturday from noon to 4 p.m. And if you're not in Houston, I did want to mention that this exhibit will be out on display in other locations. And so you can see it at Carnegie Mellon's Institute for Contemporary Art in Pittsburgh, Michigan State University's Union Art Gallery, the Contemporary Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, California, the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island, Theater Squared in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and other institutions. Keep an eye out. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much.
Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. It has been an inspiring panel. We are so honored to have you today. And thank you. And everybody go out and vote. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks.